Well, good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming back to the Center for Presidential History, to the Back to the Hilltop, <clears throat> back to Dallas Hall. And I am very excited for what we have tonight, but we'll get to that in a moment. Uh, you know, it occurs to me, I'm reminded of something that a good friend of mine who used to work for the CIA used to say, which is that whenever someone tells you that there are only two types of people in the world, a trap door should open and you should fall to the pit of eternity so you can spend all time pondering the complexity of the human experience. And I say that because I'm about to say there are two types of people in the world. There are those, I think, who live life in some ways backwards, that is to say, look back on the past and wish they could do it again. And then there are those who look at back on their life and say, thank God I don't have to do that again. <laughs> well, I think I've moved from the latter, latter category to the former this evening, and I'm gonna show you why. This is the first time I've been allowed to touch this, by the way. We are presenting tonight uh, the Center for Presidential History inaugural book prize for first time authors writing in the field of presidential history. This piece of glass makes me want to go back to graduate school so I can apply for that because <laughs> Ronna did such an amazing job of putting this together. So uh, I am now no longer allowed to hold it. Excuse me one second. It's not that she has experience with me dropping and breaking things. <laughs> In any event, uh, it is a pleasure to, to have you here tonight, and uh, especially for this book prize. We have a few changes in our calendar coming up. We're going to, in particular, be focusing on our next event, which I encourage you to mark on your calendars, which is the book talk, the book launch, I guess, in some ways, for one of our own postdoctoral fellows, Dr. Cecily Zander from Texas Women's University, who has an exciting new book out from LSU Press on Republican politics during the Civil War. And uh, we are very excited for that. And that's actually a little change in the schedule from what you might have seen if you had already marked your calendar. Uh, Monica Kim is going to be moved to a subsequent date. And we're happy to have Cecily up first. Let me also take this moment, this opportunity to do something a little bit odd and unusual, which is to thank the donor who made this particular book prize possible. Um, now, this donor has requested anonymity. It's actually kind of a lot of fun when you think about it to be able to praise an anonymous donor. Uh, for example, I can tell you that he or she was the first person in American history to win not only an Olympic gold medal, but also the Nobel, book Prize, Nobel Peace Prize. Um, now, you can't verify that. That's the best part. But I do want to take this opportunity to personally, he knows who he is or she, and I want to take this opportunity to thank them because they have been an incredible friend to the center since our beginning, not only supporting us in every single way, but I think more importantly, supporting us by helping to mentor our fellows and helping to mentor our students. And there are very few people in the world who I think could match this person for being a good soul and a mensch. So even though he or she wishes to remain anonymous, I know who you are, and I thank you. So. <clears throat> Let me then turn to the topic at hand, which is the discussion of that book prize. We received numerous submissions for this award, and the competition was quite fierce. And it's, just so you know, completely not my responsibility that a book on the end of the Cold War won. The committee came away uh, unanimous in their enthusiasm for this book. And the book is, of course, as you can see, The Triumph of Broken Promises by Professor uh, Fritz Bartel. Now, Fritz has a remarkable resume, went to University of Toronto, then got his PhD at Cornell University, studying under Fred Logeval, a man considered the dean of Vietnam studies. Also had um, Peter Katzenstein on his committee, uh, you may recall I, I went to that university as an undergrad, and Peter Katzenstein uh, taught my freshman introductory class to international relations, and I still have no idea what the hell he was talking about. <laughs> but he must have been good because he became very famous, which means either he was very smart or nobody knew what he was talking about and nobody wanted to say it. But he was famous for make, being a difficult dissertation committee member, so Fritz's mere accomplishment of surviving 
is impressive. But he did more than that. That dissertation won several prizes, both from Cornell and then from Oxford University Press. And uh, ultimately, he found himself after a stint at Yale University at the Bush School of Government at Texas A&M University, where he has been in the past an associate director of the Scowcroft Institute and is now teaching international relations not only to graduate students, as was originally the promise of his job, but now, because of changes there, to undergraduates as well. So good luck with that. <laughs> in any event, we are thrilled to have you here. We are thrilled to learn from this book and to celebrate your accomplishment. And if you would all please join me in welcoming Dr. Fritz Bartel. Thank you, Jeff. Well, uh, thank you very much, everyone, for coming out. Thank you, Jeff, for that kind introduction. Thank you to the Center for the, the honor of the book prize uh, and to SMU and to our donor who won the uh, Nobel Peace Prize and a gold medal. That's quite uh, an astonishing set of accomplishments. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm really honored to be the first recipient of this prize, and uh, I'm sure that honor will only grow as, as the list of awardees grows in the, in the future. And I really think, you know, presidential history is something that we need to be supporting because as you all, I'm sure, sense, you know, we live in a world that is, appears to be increasingly disordered. And the presidency uh, has its problems. Uh, presidents have their problems. But the office of the presidency is one of the, uh, one of the best hopes we have for gaining some kind of control over the uh, increasingly chaotic environment with, with, in which we find ourselves. And as you sense that uh, our world is in, is in perhaps crisis, uh, I'm here to say that luckily there is some historical precedent for moments of crisis, and they uh, often unexpectedly turn out uh, to be quite good outcomes. And one of the ways that this, uh, one of the ways to think about this book is how the moment of crisis, which was the, the 1970s, were a distinct moment of crisis, some of you uh, may remember, uh, for the United States and the democratic capitalist world. And yet, very unexpectedly, almost in a way that no one foresaw or intended, it turned in the 1980s into a moment of dramatic geopolitical success, the end of the Cold War. And so I'm gonna try over the course of this talk to uh, explain, at least my, give my explanation for how that decade of crisis turned into a decade of geopolitical success and offer a few comments on how presidents, in particular the man on uh, the cover of this book, Ronald Reagan, and also his successor, George H.W. Bush, what kind of influence they had over uh, these events, over this astonishing transformation. And one of the tasks we always, as presidential historians, face, one of the challenges we have, as I guess we as voters do as well, is determining what about the events that occur within a president's time in office are actually the result of the president's intention, the president's policies. Right? And one of, the thing, one of the reasons I think we're attracted to the end of the Cold War as a, as a moment in history is that it appears to be perhaps the last moment, certainly one of the greatest moments in the, in the late 20th century, when American policymakers and the president in particular seem to have distinct control or, or, or at least was able to craft world events in a direction that was in the interest of the United States. Uh, we, we, I'll, I'll show you, uh, I think we need to strike this balance, though. I'm going to go to uh, the side of the Cold War that lost in order to give you a quote that uh, Karl Marx is famous for saying, men make their own history, he said, and we can quickly edit his 19th century writing, right? Humans make their own history, but they do not make it just as they please. They do not make it under circumstances chosen by themselves, but under circumstances directly encountered and transmitted from the past. And one of the challenges we have as presidential historians is striking this balance between how individuals affect history and what instead is the result of the circumstances that they encounter. And often when we think about the end of the Cold War, we, we might tend to think in terms specifically of how presidents make their own history, 
One of the most famous moments, which some of you may remember, was Ronald Reagan standing in front of the Berlin Wall in 1987 and saying, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. And then all of a sudden, two years later, it dramatically turned into this, right? That wall actually came down. What's not to love about a story, a history, that seems to suggest, of course, that not, presidents don't just speak the words and then walls begin to fall, but that presidents and American policymakers have some sort of uh, control, some sort of ability to steer the course of world events in, their, in the direction that they choose. I think, though, the, the struggles that American presidents have had since this moment in crafting world events in the direction that they want suggest that perhaps it's not the individuals, perhaps it's not necessarily the presidents that were doing the work in this time, but rather the circumstances that Marx talked about. Right? And my project really begins <clears throat> from a circumstance that I had no awareness of about a decade ago when I began this, which really caused me to be interested in this project. And that's, that's the, this, this simple fact, but astounding fact to me. When the Berlin Wall came down, when this event happened on November 9th, 1989, the communist world was $90 billion, about $200 billion in today's terms, $90 billion in debt to Western banks and cap uh, capitalist banks and Western governments, so both, both banks and, and governments in the Western world. This made no sense to me, right? Why would a communist borrow from a capitalist? Why would a capitalist lend money to a communist? And so I set out to kind of try to just answer that set of questions for myself. But as I uncovered that history, I realized that, that exploring the history of this debt actually let us, let, allowed me at least to offer one set of explanations to some very pressing questions in the history of the late 20th century. For instance, right, why did the Cold War end? If it wasn't Reagan standing there in front of the wall, and saying, tear down the wall, and then the wall coming down. Why exactly did it end? Of course, it was a conflict that went on for four decades. By the middle of the 1980s, many people projected that it would just, there, was, there was no prospect for exiting a Cold War world. Right? It seemed to be a kind of permanent fact of life. And then all of a sudden, in the late 1980s, it very, very quickly went away. So, so offering an explanation of why it ended was something that I, I think the story of that, the history of that debt can offer us some explanation for. Second, and related, but, but almost more astonishing, why did it end peacefully? There's no, there was no reading of history, nothing in the historical record, nothing in any theory of international relations, nothing in any ideological tenant that either side in the Cold War held, there was no reason to think that not only would it end, but that it would end with almost no bloodshed. Right? If it was going to end, people assumed that it would end in a massive conflagration, and therefore that's, that's precisely why it wasn't ending. But of course it did. It ended relatively peacefully. It ended with images like this. The debt, I'm going to try to suggest to you, has something to, to say about that question. And finally, as a a third question to try to answer. What role exactly did the West, very broadly speaking, play in bringing about this astonishing turn in world events? Right? As if, you're, if you're a student of history, you, you are aware of arguments of how it was, there's a school of history that says that Ronald Reagan indeed, not just through the words he said, but through the policies he enacted, had a very decisive influence on the end of the Cold War. Many other historians over the last couple of decades have offered almost the exact counter argument that says the West had basically nothing to do with the end of the Cold War, and it was in fact people like this in the streets. And more, maybe more importantly, it was, it was the other person on the cover of this book, this is not working fast, Mikhail Gorbachev, who had the decisive role to play, right? So, but the debt I'm going to try to suggest to you tonight actually offers a new lens, a new way to think about Western influence 
in the end of the Cold War. And so as I, I started to explore these questions and, and, and craft answers to them, and I'm going to try to lay those out for you tonight, uh, the first thing I realized I had to do was to actually come up with a new definition of what exactly the Cold War was. Now you may, we all have, I think, intuitive definitions of what we think of it as in our mind. You might think of it as a security competition between Washington and Moscow. You might think of it as an arms race between the two superpowers. You might think of it as an ideological competition between democratic capitalism and state socialism. All of those have something to commend to them. They all tell us something about what the Cold War was. But I thought in order to, to tell this story, I, I had to offer a new definition as well of what the Cold War was. And that definition goes something like this. The Cold War, as, as far as I see it, began as a race between communist and capitalist uh, governments to expand the social contracts that prevailed in their societies. Now, we could take a whole semester on what social contracts are and everything. Basically, it's, it's a set of relations implicitly agreed to between populations and their governments in which the governments promise their people that they will deliver them uh, a better material existence over time and then try to deliver on that promise. And from the 19, certainly the 1950s onwards, both the capitalist and communist worlds were competing with each other by trying to offer their people a higher standard of living over time, increases in education, increases in economic and social welfare, intergenerational mobility, things like this. Right? So they were expanding the social contract that prevailed in their societies. Then both sides ran into a decade of economic crisis in the 1970s. And I'm going to argue, and I argue in the book, that this changed the conflict, the nature of the, of the Cold War competition, into a competition to discipline those social contracts. In essence, rather than raising the standard of living, at times, governments on both sides of the Iron Curtain were forced to lower the standard of living, or were forced to impose various forms of economic discipline on their populations. That's a, that's a kind of perhaps a counterintuitive way to think about a competition, a geopolitical competition, but I think it has real uh, effects. It has real explanatory effects when we come to how and why the Cold War actually ended. So to simplify this even further, you can think then of the, of the Cold War as a competition that began as a race to make promises, but it ended as a race to break promises. And I'll explain a little bit more as I go through this what exactly that meant. But with this new definition, then the argument of the book can, unfolds in a number of steps. And I'll, I'll like to walk you through those and then explain them uh, in some more detail. First, in this decade of economic crisis in the 1970s, global capital and energy markets exploded in size and importance. So the book really begins, as I'll say in a, a little bit more in a minute, with the oil shock of 1973. So in the past couple years, we've, we've realized again what role energy prices play in our domestic economy, in our politics. That really emerged for the first time in the post-war period in 1973 when the price of oil increased fourfold in a matter of months. And both societies in East and West had to figure out how to adjust. It also in turn increased the size of global capital markets, in increased the size of global money markets. That, that increase then had important implications. These markets then put pressure on governments over the course of the 1970s and 1980s to impose economic discipline on their populations for reasons I'll, I'll get into. Right? But eventually, essentially, your, your time in favor, where you're in favor of global capital markets eventually runs out and you have to turn to these policies of economic discipline. Governments that could impose discipline survived. Governments that could not impose discipline eventually collapsed. Okay? Electoral democracy, what, why did the West succeed in, in meeting this challenge? Why was the West able to impose this kind of discipline? Two, two main things. Electoral democracy and what scholars generally talk about as neoliberalism, which you might just think of as free market uh, politics, free market ideology, these gave Western states 
the political and ideological tools necessary for imposing economic discipline. And I'll talk about the specific moments where this becomes key, particularly in the United States. Of course, if you were in the Eastern Bloc, if you were a communist country, you didn't have an electoral democracy, at least not one that anyone believed in, You'd, right? You didn't have competitive elections. And you had no recourse to an ideology that praised and, and emphasized free markets. You didn't have recourse to, to neoliberalism. So you, if you didn't have these tools, then, you, then what communist governments ended up doing was they went out and sought them, right? They tried to create them. And so what we now think of as the end of the Cold War was in fact communist attempts to democratize their political system and reform their ideology, right? So what was perestroika in the Soviet Union? It was an attempt to introduce market reforms to, I mean, as I would say, impose this kind of market discipline while also democratizing the Soviet political system, right? Because someone, Mikhail Gorbachev specifically ended up concluding that the best way to carry out economic reforms was with political legitimacy that elections could grant him. Right? So in a, in a way, the end of the Cold War becomes this, as the title of the book calls, this triumph of broken promises, because it's this, this imposition, this pressure to impose economic discipline that is ultimately driving political events forward. Okay? And hopefully over the course of the next 30 minutes or so, that will become clearer as to how exactly all of these processes worked. But I said at the start on the slide before that the Cold War began as a race to make promises. And here's one of the most famous moments in the race to make promises. This is the so-called kitchen debate, 1959, between Soviet Premier Nikita Khrushchev and Richard Nixon. Right, what are they debating? They're, they're not debating the lethality of their weapons. They're debating how many dishwashers they have in their country, right? how much prosperity, how much economic and social security, how much technological change they're, they're providing, they're delivering to their populations. Right? This stands now in, in kind of history books as, the, as, as a premier marker of the competition between the two blocks over lifestyle, over, over how much of the good life you would be able to deliver to your citizens. And I argue in the book, I kind of take as a, as a stepping off point for the book, that this type of competition defined the first two and a half decades of the Cold War. Right? Khrushchev saying, I don't know if anyone's seen the clips, right, but they stand in front of the, of the cameras debating what they can offer the steel workers in their respective uh, blocks. Right? We, we give their, our steel workers housing, or we give them color television, that kind of thing. What they couldn't have known at this moment, but what we can clearly see in retrospect, is that this debate and this race to make promises was premised on a unique period of global economic history, a unique period of global economic growth. Growth that hadn't come before, had never come before 1945, and since the 1970s, or since the late 1960s, it has not reemerged again. So this is a chart giving you economic growth, uh, just kind of general per, per uh, capita GDP statistics for various regions of the world. And you see this 1950 to 1973 period, that race to make promises, is uniquely high, right? In the world at large, in the United States, in Western Europe, in Eastern Europe, and in the Soviet Union. And so right around 1970, for a series of reasons that historians still contest, and there's, there's many different factors that go into it, economic growth in both the East and the West severely stagnated. Right? So the West enters this decade of stagflation, as it's called, uh, throughout the United States. Right? And in the Soviet Union, it's simply referred to as the era of stagnation eventually. Right? So both sides are now debating how can we relaunch the engine of economic growth that got us this far? Right? And into the void of this unexpected economic stagnation comes the, the, the oil shock of 1973 and early 1974 to transform the economic conditions 
of the world as a whole. So as you see over here, this is the uh, real world price of, of oil in the late 20th century. And here's the fourfold increase right in the, at the end of 1973. And again, in 1979, the second oil, oil crisis. If you're an energy producer like the Soviet Union, this oil shock arrives for you as a massive windfall, right? So rather, than, as, you, rather as you address this problem of economic stagda stagnation, you now have this enormously wealthy uh, source of wealth, this energy wealth, that you can use to continue the race to make promises at home, right? that you can use to kind of paper over the economic problems of your society. If you're not, though, an energy producer like the Soviet Union or like Saudi Arabia or something like that, then you have to turn to capital markets. Right? You have to start to borrow money as a way of delaying your adjustment to these high energy prices. Right? And, it, and luckily for everyone at this time, countries who, who absorb all of this, the funding that comes with the oil shock, someone like Saudi Arabia, has to put that money somewhere. And they put it on international capital markets, what we call, what were called at the time and are still to this day known as the Euro markets. Right? And so you can see the growth of these Euro markets over the course of the 1970s and in the early 1980s, right? go from almost nothing in the late 1960s to almost a trillion dollars uh, by the, by the mid-1980s. So I argue in the book that this New, these two new sources of wealth, energy and finance, were significant enough that they fundamentally transformed the nature of the Cold War. In fact, they, they, they lead to what I call the privatization of the Cold War. What did this mean? It meant that this race to make promises, this idea that if you're standing, you know, Khrushchev and Nixon standing in the kitchen, that race to make promises now depended on finance and energy. If nation states, like the Soviet Union, had continued to have access to energy or finance, then they could continue to make promises at home. Right? They could continue to promise their, better peop their people a better life. They could continue to fight the Cold War abroad. They could give finance and aid to their allies. Uh, they could continue to build up their military budgets, that kind of thing. Right? That was true for both the United States and the Soviet Union. If, however, they ever lost access to this energy and finance, then they'd have to turn to breaking promises. Right? Then they'd have to turn to these policies of economic discipline. And so energy and finance start to kind of mediate the relationship that governments have with their own citizens. And as soon as the, the confidence or the prosperity of energy and finance markets run, run out, that's when you have to turn to these politics of breaking promises. Diplomacy in this era then reflected, in Cold War diplomacy in the 1970s and 1980s, very much reflected this privatization of the Cold War. Right? Diplomacy became, much as it is down to the present day, if you think about how we've reacted to the war in Ukraine, right? what have we tried to do? We try to control both Russian energy and oil exports and also use the tools of finance to cut off their access to global capital markets, right? So diplomacy starts to reflect this new reality as well. And that's very much true in the 1970s and 1980s, just as it's true uh, today. And out of all the places in the world that uh, might have been favored by this new alignment, surprisingly, the place that, that drew the most uh, benefit from this new arrangement of oil and finance was the Eastern Bloc itself. So, in the 1970s, if you were a banker, if you were working at Citibank or something, and you were on the international desk and trying to figure out where to put your money, shockingly, a place like communist Poland was, was the best bet. Because a place like communist Poland didn't have any inflation, it had authoritarianism, and it had Soviet energy in the background. Right? So it was assumed that if you lent them money, they would very easily be able to pay you back. And so this is the cover of Euro Money magazine. It was the kind of leading uh, trade publication for the international financial world in the 1970s. And this, as you can see, is January 1977, where they looked back at the year before and looked at the leading, the leading stories that had defined 1976. And the leading story of that year for the international financial community, basically the leading edge of free market capitalism, was in fact 
capitalism's relationship to its ideological uh, opponent, the socialist world. Right? The Eastern Bloc moves closer to the Euro markets. So as East, the Eastern Bloc has this access to uh, capital markets, it can defer the challenge of breaking promises, right? because it has this access from the West. At the same time, it also has preferential access to Soviet energy reserves. And this is a, my estimation based on archival research of the annual subsidy that the Soviet Union was giving to its allies because it charged them a lower price on an annual basis for oil and gas. And you can see it, it goes up in particular in moments uh, right after the oil shocks, right? So in 1974, it's $4 billion. Certainly by, the, by 1980 and 81, over $10 billion. If you were in Moscow, you, cer you certainly felt a certain amount of ideological uh, solidarity and brotherhood with your allies. But numbers like $10 billion a year eventually started to get people's attention, right? And there starts to become a divergence between how Soviet policymakers understand their national interest and how they think about the interests of their allies, particularly in Eastern Europe. And over the course of then the 1980s, this will become a key issue for them. How do they free themselves from the economic burden caused by the oil shock? So if you're a country in Eastern Europe, and you go through the 1970s, you're observing the capitalist world, it's facing this economic stagflation. You have this preferential access to energy and finance. Everything looks great, right? It looks great until the moment when you start to lose access to these two uh, sources of wealth. And you'll lose, the, it turns out that they will lose access to this, particularly the source of finance, precisely at the moment that the United States conquers or addresses its own challenge of breaking promises. As many of you would recall from the 1970s, or perhaps you've read in newspaper articles recently, right, as we deal with inflation in 2022, 2023, 2024, the 1970s were, of course, a decade defined by inflation in the United States, right? And this man, Paul Volcker, becomes the chairman of the Federal Reserve in 1979, and he sends interest rates, as the German Chancellor, West German Chancellor Helmut Schmidt said, uh, to their highest levels since Jesus Christ, right? <laughs> So something on the order of 18, 19% in real terms, seven, eight, nine percent in the late 1970s, right? Over the past couple years, we've gone from basically zero to five percent. So we're talking four times that level, almost, right, in the late 1970s in order to conquer the challenge of inflation. Conquering this challenge, of course, came with significant downsides. It caused the greatest, up till that time, the greatest recession in post-war U.S. history. It put something like two million Americans out of their jobs. Right? It, it began or it accelerated the deindustrialization of the American heartland. Right? So there's enormous, significant economic costs. There's enormous broken promises that come with this conquering of inflation. But Volcker is able to do it because he's, first of all, lives in a market economy. Right? So there's many more people who are willing to sign up for the challenge of, and endorse the challenge of prioritizing inflation over employment. He's also able to rely on a narrative of market forces. Right? He's able to say that, yes, I'm raising interest rates, but particularly because he's, he switches to a doctrine called monetarism, he says, the interest rates are really being set by the market. They're not being set by me. Right? So this is where this neoliberalism, the embrace of free markets, becomes very, very important. Because American policymakers are able to say, it's not, it's not the policymakers breaking the promises. Right? It's the market that's doing the work. That's a, that's a kind of move, that's a kind of strategy that is not available to policymakers in the Eastern Bloc. Ronald Reagan, of course, comes into office and is very much supportive of Volcker's policies. Right? He views inflation as something that needs to be conquered very quickly. He's willing to bear some cost for that. And yet, at the same time, he's also very much focused on two primary political priorities, right? One, cutting taxes for Americans domestically, and two, dramatically expanding the, the defense budget uh, to fight the Cold War abroad. The question, of course, at this moment was how exactly would you pay for all of this? 
And he goes through the campaign uh, in an environment of inflation and comes up with some numbers that seem to allow him to suggest that he can pay for it all. It turns out, though, in 1981, right as Volcker's conquering inflation and inflation begins to go down, that his new tax policies and defense policies are causing, in the words of his uh, economic advisor, his, his director of office uh, of the OMB, David Stockman, right, the Reagan tax cuts unleashed a massive fiscal error on the national and world economy. The budget projections produced deficits as far as the eye can see. They showed cumulative red ink over five years of more than $700 billion. That was nearly as much national debt as, as it had taken American 200 years to accumulate. It just took your breath away. Right, so this is right at the moment, let's say late 1981. The tax cuts have been passed. Inflation's coming down. And there's now $700 billion of uncovered funding liabilities for the, for the five years ahead. The question is, how exactly do you pay for it? And no one really had an answer. Right? There, it was assumed that something was going to have to give. Either Reagan was going to have to give up on his priorities, uh, or there would be a crowding out effect in the marketplace, and the, and the United States would kind of enter a permanent or certainly a long-term recession. And it turned out to be something that no one really expected. It turned out to be the rest of the world that would pay for it. Right? So rather than Americans balancing their books, Instead, capital, which had been flowing out to the rest of the world over the course of the 1970s, came rushing back into the United States. 1983, on a net basis, $85 billion comes back into the United States. 1984, 103. 1985, 129. 1986, $220 billion. So by 1986, the federal budget deficits roughly in line with this, and therefore you can, you can think, you could say, that by the mid-1980s, the rest of the world is essentially covering all of the uh, difference between American taxes and American spending. Right? This, in the book, I call this the Reagan financial buildup, and I think we need to think of it as just as powerful, if not more so, than the Reagan military buildup, for which Reagan's much more well known. Right? Because this and you'll see here, right, the same magazine, Euro Money, which had been so exuberant in the mid-1970s, now literally looks on the world, right, with shock and horror, the sudden horror of lending to governments. Of course, that meant the gov every other government around the world, not except for the United States, because now all the money was coming back into the U.S. And this historic change of capital flows out from the rest of the world back into the United States is what underlies then Reagan's Cold War strategy. It's what allows Reagan's Cold War strategy to succeed. So in, if we think back to Marx's formulation between the individuals and the circumstances doing their history, they're working together right here. Right? Because of course Reagan's known as the president who uh, embraced Star Wars, embraced missile defense, embraced a, a, a military buildup. He's less well known but equally decisive for his embrace of a financial strategy to try to weaken the Soviet bloc. And both of these, because of this historical change in circumstances, produce effects within the Eastern bloc. So in the early 1980s, as you know, he, he builds up the American military in the hopes of bringing the Soviets to the negotiating table. And we now have evidence of what this looked like on the opposite side. So this is Mikhail Gorbachev to the Politburo in September 1986, right before he's about to leave for the summit at Reykjavik. What does he say? He says, a new stage of the arms race would be a loss everywhere, especially wearing down our economy. If they impose a second stage of the arms race, we will lose. Right? This is the kind of sentiment, this is the kind of so change in Soviet thinking which produces the major arms control agreements which we associate with the end of the Cold War. It's all born of, yes, Reagan's strategy, but more importantly, the change in global political economy that has pre been precipitated by the combination of Reagan and Volcker. Even more quickly, the financial strategy begins to have an effect. On the very same day, so this is, produced, this is a CIA report produced in April 1982, April 8, 1982. The cool part about doing international history is you can now see exactly what was happening on the same day on the other side of the Iron Curtain. 
and Vladimir Alkimov, the head of the Soviet Gosp Bank, the head of the Soviet Central Bank, is meeting with his allies trying to figure out how to respond to what he calls the comprehensive currency war that the US is currently waging against uh, the socialist world. With a total credit boycott, the aim is to organize the insolvency of the socialist countries and to discredit the reputation of the USSR. Now he thinks, and the Soviets think, that this is the intentional Reagan strategy having an effect. But as you can see, right, the Reagan strategy isn't really even in place in April 1982. What in fact is happening is, is he's noticing that shift in global capital flows, right? He's noticing that rather than money flowing into the Eastern Bloc as it had been for the 1970s, in fact, it's now flowing out of the Eastern Bloc and back to the rest of the world, right? So that's the combination of Volcker and Reagan's policies having this whiplash effect that really no one intended. So there's no intentional strategy going on here to combine monetary and fiscal policy, but that's the effect that it's having. And in total, this then produces for the Eastern Bloc a really uh, tenuous and very adverse set of global conditions. As you see on the left, this is the communist bloc's so-called current account balance. This means how much money on an annual basis is flowing in or out of the bloc as a whole. And anything below the zero line means that it's importing money from the rest of the world. Anything above the zero line means they're exporting money back to the rest of the world. And you can see over the course of the 1970s that it was on net a very, very strong importer of capital. And then precisely in 1981, 82, when the Volcker shock has this effect, money just as quickly flows back out. So capital markets, as they had been embracing the communist world in the 70s, just as decisively turn against them in the 1980s. Normally during this time, you would hope if you were a communist leader in the Eastern Bloc, you could rely on the Soviet Union to back you up in these circumstances. But because of problems in the Soviet domestic economy, and particularly in their oil and gas industry, at the exact same moment, the Soviets start to cut off and cut back the energy exports that they had been sending to the bloc in the 1970s. So after a, over a decade of, of continuous energy export, economic, uh, export growth from the Soviet Union to its allies, it now begins to plateau and, in fact, start to fall back down in the early 1980s. This leaves the bloc, as you can imagine, completely exposed. Right? Where do you turn? How do you, how do you solve this problem? Mikhail Gorbachev is going to come along and tell them, you're not going to solve it on the backs of the Soviet Union. That's one of his main messages. We, re we remember him today, and, and when he died a couple of years ago, we, we remember him as an idealist, which he certainly was, but he was also very much looking out for the interests of the Soviet Union, as, as any leader of the Soviet Union would. Right? And in 1986, specifically we now have the, the documents for this, he repeals the Brezhnev, the so-called Brezhnev Doctrine, uh, which was the Soviet Union's promise and uh, uh, declaration of its own uh, willingness and necessity of intervening in its allies' affairs to protect socialism. This is the East German transcript of his uh, meeting in November 1986, where he, he officially kind of tells, tells the, the allies that they can no longer count on the Soviet Union. And what does he say? It's very important in terms of how he tries to uh, justify this change. He tells them first, we lived on credit, right? Explaining or telling all of his allies about the 1970s. The problem, we lived on credit. The problem with living on credit is that sooner or later, one must pay for it, right? And he was there to tell them that the Soviet Union was not going to be the one to do it. As he, would, as he said to, to the community, of allies in words that would have had enormous significance to them. No one, no country, can claim a special role in the socialist community anymore. Right? That's precisely what the Soviet Union had done for over four decades. And now he was saying, because of the economic predicament which the bloc found, in which the bloc found itself, no one's going to claim that role anymore. So don't come to us looking to solve your problems. This leads directly then to the events we now think of as the end of the Cold War. If you were in Poland, if you were in Warsaw in the late 1980s, you saw your debt continuously rising 
and you needed a way to get out of it. You needed a way to regain access to Western capital markets to try to overcome the financial difficulties with which you found yourself in. Western financial actors told, would tell you at that time, as they told the Polish government, the only way that we will renew your access to, to these markets is if you impose domestic austerity, if you impose policies of economic discipline on your own population. Right? Because what they're interested in getting is, is capital exported back out of a place like Poland or Hungary or East Germany, back out of these locations and back onto global, global capital markets, back to the creditors themselves. So the, the challenge for a, a country like Poland would have been how do you legitimize a policy of austerity? How do you ask your population to sacrifice even more than they've already sacrificed in order to restore your, the, your conf the confidence of international creditors in your country? And their solution turned out to be this, the roundtable agreement of, of the spring of 1989. Right? Essentially what the Polish government was trying to do was trade democracy for the acceptance of austerity. They said, we'll let you into the government, we'll bring you into the governing structures of, of Poland, the same thing happened in Hungary, and in exchange we're going to ask society to accept policies of economic discipline, to accept broken promises. This is uh, one piece of evidence that would suggest how this looks. So this is from the IMF archives. It's the kind of document that crafted this entire book because when I saw this, I think it was after lunch one day, I was, I was almost falling asleep and I saw these lines underlined and I thought this must be important, right? They underlined it precisely so that I, wouldn't, I would be sure not to miss it. This is from one IMF official to another explaining a, a conversation that he's had with a Polish financial official uh, in February 1989. He says, the Polish official says, the main immediate purpose of the roundtable talks is to offer a political concession so as to facilitate the authorities' economic plans. Right? Offer democracy in exchange for society's acceptance of austerity, which will in turn renew the confidence that global uh, capital markets, that, that global capital has in our country. This is, of course, precisely what happened, right? Over the summer of 1989, the, Polish, uh, the Poles hold their first basically free elections since the late 1940s, uh, and solidarity, the, the labor union solidarity, eventually ends up as the, Pol the first non-communist government in Eastern Europe since the start of the Cold War. This kind of trade of democracy for austerity is something that the, Bush the Reagan and Bush administrations were both vaguely aware of in, in pushing their, uh, their counterparts in Poland and Eastern Europe towards. This is Condoleezza Rice, long before she had uh, the, the biggest jobs, some of the biggest jobs in the US government about uh, 15 years later. She's on the NSC at this time writing an internal document about uh, how, how, the government, how the U.S. government should respond to these dramatic political changes that are unfolding in Eastern Europe. And she says the following, we've told all the Eastern Europeans that political reform is a, poli is a precondition for economic reform because illegitimate governments cannot impose strict austerity measures. So the Bush administration and the Reagan administration before it were holding out hope and in fact, not just hope, were holding all of their financial resources back until they saw these two things emerge in the Eastern Bloc, both political liberalism and economic discipline. And in the book, I call this the power of omission. And I think it's something that we all can remember about how exactly the power of the presidency works. Right? Often it's precisely what US presidents are not doing. It's precisely the resources that they're withholding that are causing political change and creating leverage for the US government out in the world. And this is exactly what was happening in 1989. There was all kinds of pressure on Bush to respond more forcefully to the events as they were unfolding. There's a big debate within the government about should we give them money right away? Should we wait until we get exactly what we want? Bush ends up siding with the Treasury Department that says we have to wait until the austerity measures arrive. Now you can, you can 
lament that, you can dislike that policy, but what it, one thing it no doubt caused was more dramatic political change. Over the course of 1989, Polish democracy comes into uh, fuller form. Eventually, the new solidarity government adopts an, a policy of austerity that will use exactly that democratic legitimacy in order to get, uh, to, to overcome the opposition from Polish workers specifically. And then, only then, by the end of 1989, does the Bush administration kind of release the reins on financial support that had been withholding. I'll just end with where we started, back at the Berlin Wall. As Poland and Hungary are going through their processes of roundtable negotiations and democratic liberalization, it looks to the outside world like there's not a great deal of change happening in East Germany. Right? The wall still stands, there's some protests in the streets, uh, but there's, not a, there's not, certainly no significant reform movement from within the East German state. One thing they are dealing with, though, is the same problem that all the other governments in the region are dealing with, and that is the problem of debt. They're, they're running out of access to Western creditors, and they're trying to resolve this problem and figure out how to get new access to Western loans. This is one document that uh, takes up the solution that they end up deciding on. And that solution is to trade the opening of the Berlin Wall in exchange for Western financial relief. So this is October 13th, 1989. It's a, a, a letter from the kind of chief financial official of the East German government to the leader of East Germany, basically proposing that they begin negotiations with West Germany to open the Berlin Wall in exchange for billions of dollars in return. And that's precisely the negotiations that were going on on November 9th when the Berlin Wall opened. And so, th so this trade of another form of political liberalization, this time opening borders, in exchange for financial assistance was something that was also driving forces ahead in East Germany. So we're left with this then, the triumph of broken promises. I don't think we should have any uh, qualms about stating that the West won the Cold War and won the Cold War decisively. The question is what exactly, what kind of competition was the West really winning, right? And it, as, as I hopefully have laid out here now for uh, a bit of time, there's a good case to be made that that competition was actually one of imposing economic dis discipline, of actually breaking promises to your people and that's the, that's the challenge that the Western world, because of democracy and because of free market ideology, was able to, to meet. That was the challenge that the communist world was not able to meet. And that's the, the force that was driving ahead uh, the events that eventually produced the end of the Cold War. So thank you very much. I look forward to your questions. I have questions, uh, but I'm not going to ask them yet. Uh, we do have time for some questions, and as always, we have some microphones that are on either side. Uh, if you wouldn't mind, of course, waiting for the microphone to get to you so that uh, the sound goes into the camera and we can record your voice for posterity. Uh, I'm going to let you, Professor, sure. call your own questions. Okay. Sure. I have a question about the Reagan buildup. Uh, as I understand it, Volcker raises the interest rates, uh, and then uh, it affects this uh, money flowing in from the rest of the world in the United States, mm -hmm. and that started all of the, this, this process. What was the uh, monetary mechanism that affected the Reagan buildup? What did raising the interest rates in the United States do to cause this sucking sound of money coming back to the United States? Uh, so the, you mean the financial buildup? What, what caused the financial buildup? Uh, basically, the Federal Reserve, and they were quite explicit about this, because they saw after Reagan enacted his tax policies, they saw that they were going to have to depend on money from the rest of the world that they would set their interest rates just higher, uh, higher than, the re than interest rates in Japan and Europe so that those who were trying to 
you know, shift money between the various regions would choose the United States over the rest of the world. And so if you, this is one of the reasons that Helmut Schmidt had comments on U.S. interest rates because he knew that the West German Bundesbank, for instance, had to increase interest rates in response to try to keep some money in Europe and some for, or money in Japan or something like that. So it's this, because interest rates are higher relative to the rest of the world, and the part that I couldn't talk about uh, here, but unfolding alongside this in the communist world is the, what we now call the Polish crisis. So solidarity is first emerging in Poland in response to the Polish government attempting to impose austerity or ra raise com uh, consumer prices in Poland. And so all of the narratives of the 1970s, the idea that democracies would be bad at imposing austerity and authoritarians would be good at doing it, or that democracy was ungovernable, as people said in the 70s, but the Soviets would somehow be very good at this. All of the narratives were transforming before people's eyes, and they started to put their money where their new confidence was, and their confidence was now in the United States and not in the communist bloc. Um, right here, right so. So my question is, did Reagan really have a sense of this as leverage? You talked about Bush doing that, but did Reagan, you know, your 1982 uh, National mm -hmm. Intelligence Memorandum talked about it, mm -hmm. and as a former CIA analyst, it makes me feel good to see that there, we actually did write something that potentially had an <laughs> impact, as opposed to all the criticism that we got about all how we didn't predict the end of the right, Cold right. War. But did, did Reagan really understand that, or was he just focused on the defense buildup? Um, he understood it. Uh, I mean, someone like Caspar Weinberger understood it very, very well. I, I quote in the book, he says something like, um, money is, or a loan is just as important as a plane. Uh, so they, they see a very distinct equality between all kinds of resources that you put at the Soviet Union's disposal. And so if you're, if you're allowing them to sell energy to Germany, right, which is, was still an issue even as late as two years ago, or you're allowing them to get loans on international capital markets, to a person like Ronald Reagan, that just looks like you're subsidizing communism. And so he says, why, why are we doing any of this? Why don't we try to cut it all off? The problem is very, other, very few other people, particularly not in the United States, agree with his approach to diplomacy. And so as a diplomatic strategy, much of this fails. So he doesn't get the Europeans to stop buying Russian or Soviet gas. He doesn't get them to cut off uh, subsidized loans that their exporters are giving to the Soviet Union. So as, and so by the, let's say the summer of 1982, to people in the Reagan administration, it looks like their very forceful policies and strategies of using energy and finance have failed because no one seems to be going along with it. What they, I guess, because I couldn't find much, uh, much documentary evidence for it, they don't quite see, even though people on the, east, the Eastern side can clearly see, that Volcker's policies are accomplishing what they can't do through diplomacy, Volcker is doing very, very quickly through monetary policy. And I don't know why, but no one seems to have made that connection quite clearly, even though central bankers in the Eastern Bloc were regularly lamenting uh, Volcker's policies because it made their life very, very difficult. Thank you for the question. Um, right, right here, yeah. I can hear you, but yeah. yeah please. I'm just wondering, you had said that things changed at this point going forward. Is that still the case? That we're, it's not so much they want to be in a democracy as much as they need the capital markets. Is that what's happening today in the EU and everywhere else, that it's economics? <laughs> uh, I wish it were only, I wish it were so. Or, um, but no, I, I think one thing that uh, particularly the last three years has shown us is that now the Russian government has gotten much more adept at uh, building up defenses against the global economy, 
right, and insulating themselves from sources of Western leverage. Uh, and so, and they've also become much more circumspect in the promises that they make to their people, right? So Putin, some of his, a great deal of his popularity in the first decade of his time in office was in a sense an implicit promise or cer he certainly delivered increasing standards of living to, to ordinary Russians, particularly in comparison to what was going on in the 1990s. But he's had very little uh, hesitancy to trade foreign aggression for uh, economic hardship at home. So living standards in Russia haven't increased basically, or have in fact gone down since 2014. And this has very little impact on Russian international behavior, obviously. Right? So from an ideological standpoint, from a political standpoint, they are less uh, constrained by the promises that they've made to their population than the Soviet officials were. So regularly in the, in the late 1980s, Soviet officials would recognize that there was an economic reform solution that they wanted, but they would, re, they would pre, refrain from carrying it out because they were afraid of the ideological and domestic political ramifications of that. And that fear is no longer, uh, it doesn't have the purchase that it once did, uh, certainly in, in the Russia of today. I think there's some questions on the far side. Yes. I remember you mentioned that at the end of the Cold War, it was a race to break promises. Uh, what promises did the U.S. break in order to win the Cold War? It's a great question. So um, the first and biggest promise that they broke was the promise of prioritizing full employment over other uh, social goals. So throughout the 1970s, if you look at kind of government and certainly central uh, Federal Reserve uh, policy making discussions, they're holding back or they're, they're hesitant about essentially doing what Volcker did precisely because they're very committed, as you would hope they would be, to the, to the priority of maintaining full employment in the United States. So in the book I say there's, there's three promises that the United States had made and really Western governments in general had made to their pe people after 1945 that by the time 1980 comes around, these promises can no longer be kept. So they had, they had said, we'll have full employment, we'll have rising wages or rising incomes, and we'll have job security for large parts of our populations. After 1980, essentially no Western government figure, figures out how to deliver all three of these anymore. So in Europe, you get uh, job security, you get a protection at least if not, in some rising incomes, but you, you don't get full employment. You start to get uh, unemployment rates of 10, 12%. In the United States, we returned to full, full employment fairly quickly by 1984, 1985, uh, or at least we're, we're coming closer to it. But instead, we, uh, per, for, particularly for large sections of the population, right, incomes and income growth start to flatline and job security becomes much more precarious for many Americans. And so this trade of rising incomes, job security, and full employment, these things that Western governments had built their legitimacy on in the first half of the Cold War or in the post-war period, no government or very, very few figure out ways to maintain all three of those after 1980. So those, I think, are the kind of cornerstone broken promises. Other questions? Right here. So my question is around China. Uh, uh -huh. I know that during the Korean War, kind of 19, early 1950s, that China and the USSR were aligned against the United States. Um, I think in the time frame that we're discussing, that relationship sort of seems to drift, and China comes much closer to the United States. Mm -hmm. um, I know one of the dynamics that kept that helped rein in inflation in the United States was exporting, or sorry, importing goods from China. Mm -hmm. oh, um, yeah. But we were also importing great amounts of capital from China, beginning and to this day. Uh, so, just kind of a question for you is, why do you think China switched sides? I guess, um, and what role do you think that played in, in some of the bigger picture stuff you're talking about here tonight? 
Yeah, um, obviously immensely important questions. The reasons why China switched sides are um, many. I think one of them is they, uh, one of the most important is they grew to fear the Soviet Union more than they feared the United States. Uh, so certainly in terms of why Mao heads in the direction of not alignment with the United States, but openness to the United States. Uh, I think it's a kind of geopolitical balancing that he's doing because the Soviets and the Chinese fight a small border war in 1969. Uh, the Americans signal that they're kind of open to this. And he sees geopolitical opportunity and, and uh, insurance in having the option to go towards the United States or go to back towards the Soviet Union if that door ever reopens. By the time you get to Deng Xiaoping, I think it's much more of the economic uh, side that you're, you were referencing, right, where he, uh, I'm going to butcher the famous phrase, right, but he doesn't care if it's a black cat or a white cat as long as the cat catches mice. He doesn't care what ideological system you're, you, he, he has in China as long as it produces year-over-year uh, -year economic growth, right, as long as it produces economic development. And so that becomes key, let's say, from 1978, 1979 onwards. And the Chinese become, they're partially relevant to the 1980s story in terms of containing inflation, right? But that's, I think, in this period, a much more of a Japanese story, right? When the Chinese become, they kind of take the place of the Japanese by, let's say, the 1990s and certainly the 2000s. But the idea that, yes, imports are, were a way to regain price stability, but at the expense, of course, of many, many American jobs, uh, that's a trade-off that the Reagan administration was fully comfortable making, again, because of their overall confidence in, in that this is just, this is the work of the marketplace. So if this is what the market determines, uh, that's, that's the way it should be. There were, someone like Jim Baker in, in Reagan's administration doesn't quite believe it to this degree, and so he wants to kind of reverse some of these trends, and he does so in the later Reagan years uh, and into the Bush years. But the, the general belief right, that the market is going to determine the outcomes that uh, it will, and we should just respect what the market's doing, uh, that's a key part of at least the first Reagan term in their economic policy. Right, yeah. Thanks so much. This is actually a follow-on to that point. Um, my question is around, I like this idea of the free market ideology affording the United States the ability to kind of make different arguments um, about kind of shift blame away from the policymakers and on to um, the market itself. But I wondered, what did, what did policymakers say to the people left unemployed? Like, I, I think, you know, in theory, that makes sense to me that that would be embedded within the free market system, but in the actual, how do they communicate to individuals that had been less dis left disaffected during this period? Yeah, you know, I think there's a lot of different arguments that, that are made, um, but if you take the famous phrase from Reagan's first inaugural address, right, government is not the solution to the problem, the government is the problem. If you switch, right, if, if, if you set the terms of the debate on that level, and I mean, he was elected president, so there were clearly many, many people who were at least willing to give that uh, basic idea, fun, fundamental idea, uh, a chance, right? Then broken promises or closed factories or uh, unemployment or even, uh, or, or, constraining or flat-out attacking the power of labor unions, right, starts to look and can be phrased as, and not just phrase, I don't, it's not a conspiratorial thing, but can literally be thought as freeing the individual from all kinds of uh, regulation or control, whether that's the state, whether that's a union, whether that's a company, right? It's, it's a, the new promise that, that is made is that you are now a free, individualistic, American uh, citizen that can pursue their own interests in the market just like everyone else. And so, so it's really a, uh, I guess it would, it's a language of, of liberation, of liberating the individual from various constraints rather than 
right? Breaking promises of, of, of uh, commitments that have been made in the past. Even though it's the same exact action, it's phrased in terms, much more in terms of liberation rather than, of course, uh, breaking promises. Because there's few people who flat out will tell you, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm breaking a promise that the government made to you many, many years ago, right? Even though that's, that's the exact same thing, it can be phrased in very different ways. I'm going to take the opportunity to the final question here. Um, this has been a wonderful talk. First, I want to make an observation, just because I feel the need these days to send everyone home screaming in the night. Uh, <laughs> if ultimately one of the takeaways of your book is that the system that loses legitimacy in the eyes of its public is not able to make the changes necessary for a changing world and then collapses, it strikes me as a troubling moment to note that there's a lot of legitimacy questions swirling throughout our politics today, mm -hmm. uh, perhaps undermining our ability to meet the crisis that comes next. Mm -hmm. But that's not my question. Okay. <laughs> uh, my question is, you, you pose at the beginning the, that you're going to help us understand how the Cold War ended so peacefully. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if you could address that a little bit more, because this is the, you know, arguably the first time in human history that a global superpower, or a global empire, excuse me, or an empire, collapses without an ensuing great power war. Mm -hmm. So, why? Yes, ab absolutely. Um, you, you know, I think it's uh, breaking promises in both international and domestic dimensions. So as I, I try, hopefully laid out in some detail, uh, the Soviet Union, right, the major question in 1989 was would the Soviet Union, and certainly in the years prior, would the Soviet Union intervene to stop revolutions from happening, right? That had, that had been what they'd done in 1956. That had been what they'd done in 1968. In 1981, they had put immense pressure on the Polish government to crush solidarity and impose martial law. So would they do the same thing again? And the, stand, the usual answer, and it's, there's a lot there to it, is that Gorbachev just had a, a kind of a personal aversion to violence. And he was trying to create a new world order that was much more peaceful and therefore he was not going to intervene to stop self-determination in the Eastern Bloc. And there's some, certainly something to that. The problem is there were many, many other people in the Soviet leadership who didn't care about those kinds of things at all. So why didn't they stop it? And in, in those respects, it's much more uh, the economic argument. Right? They, they're looking at the, what's going on in Eastern Europe and they're saying, we might like to stop it, but we know that this is gonna cost us billions and billions of dollars, and not to mention military intervention in order to make that happen. And as they know during the 1980s that they're falling further behind the United States, they think that what, they, what Gorbachev has convinced them of is that they have to focus more on reviving the Soviet Union than continuing to intervene around the world because if they don't revive the Soviet Union, they're going to lose the contest anyway. So the Soviets don't intervene. But that doesn't necessarily mean that the leaders of the communist bloc themselves won't crack down violently on the protests, right? In East Berlin, in East Germany, one of the major questions was, will there be a Chinese solution to what goes on in, in, to the protests in Germany? So June 1989, Tiananmen Square, the Chinese government cracks down on their own domestic protests. Would there be a similar outcome in Germany? And we have now the direct uh, documents showing that the East German leadership was very much concerned and very much aware of the fact that if they cracked down, they would lose all access to Western capital. And so they, would ha they, they literally quantified it as 30% of, they, they believed if they cracked down, they would have to also impose a 30% fall in living standards domestically. And that was something they weren't willing to do. And therefore, they didn't violently crack down on their own populations. So, so it's not a foolproof w way, I mean, I should stress that, right? Financial dependence, as we've seen in cases like Iran or, uh, or Russia today, right? It doesn't always mean that it will lead to peaceful outcomes, of course. But it does, in some cases, like this, like the end of the Cold War, it did offer uh, and give those leaders a reason to hesitate, a significant reason that they eventually found convincing to hesitate before violently cracking down on their, on their own populations. So that's how you end up with a, a peaceful end of the Cold War. Excellent, thank you. Thank you very much, everybody.